welcome back to the Profit Roadmap. As always, we're your hosts, Ryan and Becca, and this is the premier podcast created for field service pros to help you grow your business, stay on top of the latest trends, and help you provide even more value to the communities that you serve. Now, today, we're actually excited to welcome someone uh, very near and dear to uh, Becca and I's hearts. Uh, we've got Jesse Barrick, who is the Senior Vice President of Business Development here at Field Engine Service Autopilot. Now, before joining our team here, he was actually uh, in the HVAC industry for companies like Mycroft and Carrier. So Jesse is actually here today to share some unique insights that he's got, uh, practices from service pros, how to handle many of the unique challenges we're all facing, potential recession, the challenging or changing behaviors of consumers, and then increased interest rates, so much more. Welcome to Profit Roadmap. Jesse, how are you doing today? Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, no, I'm doing great and uh, really excited to to be here and, and share some some knowledge. And it's not my knowledge. It's just me being a good listener from our members and our partners. <laughs> To the industry and i get to summarize it and share it back so awesome that's very valuable though all right so jesse could you tell us a little bit about your background sort of how you joined the field edge and service autopilot family and and how you got here yeah that's that's perfect and i'll keep it short um you mentioned that i was with carrier i was with carrier in florida on the distribution side for about 20 years uh really Worked my way up from call center to my last role there was the vice president of sales and marketing for what was really one of the largest distributors in the world. Um, got to got the chance to learn a lot um, from the sales side, the marketing side, the contractor side um, that applies across the industry. And then I joined Mycroft about eight, eight and a half, nine years ago. And um, they're a finance company that specializes in HVAC and helping homeowners get systems. And so... My job there was very similar to my job here at Field Edge, which is, you know, working with partners and creating partnerships and creating opportunity for our members, um, you know, through partnerships that help improve our product. So um, joined Field Edge about a year and a half ago and just really loving it. Um, you know, Field Edge for me is a great opportunity because we solve a lot of problems for our members, for our contractors, uh, customers. And so being able to solve those problems in the industry is what I've been about since I started. And so I'm really enjoying my time here and, and uh, lots of runway still. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been, uh, it's been fun. I can't believe it's already been over a year. Yeah. Eight, almost 19 months. Yeah, I remember the email came through. It was like, welcome Jesse Barry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exciting. It, was like it was just the other day, but yeah, that, that is super exciting. So uh, you've been in the industry for a while. Um, are there any specific uh, data points or, of uh, insights that you've gathered over the years that are just particularly interesting to you? Yeah, I'm not going to say I've seen it all, but I've seen the cyclical nature of our industry <laughs> or contracting industry. Um, you know, it's interesting. We're probably like neck deep in the third round in HAC side anyways of consolidation where, um, you know, bigger money comes in and buys up local contractors, consolidates them and tries to develop that. I, I like the current one now because, um, I think they tend to keep the existing owners on, which if you know anything about a local contractor, they're the ones with the relationships. They're the ones tied to the community. And so um, if the money comes in when they kick out the owner, it doesn't work very well. And so I think what we're seeing now is a, is a good trend where it is working. Um, other than that, we see the same kind of economic trends going up and down. And I've been through, I don't know, this will probably be my third. I don't think we're going to have a recession, but um, the third sort of downturn or, or weird economic time in my career and um, all the challenges that go with that. And, and so, yeah, no, I, but I've seen how much it's grown from no technology to, um, you know, really starting to embrace technology and using technology, which is good. We're catching up to other industries and that's that's helpful. So. That's awesome. interesting. Is that like an HVAC thing when you mention technology? Because I've heard that for previous guests. Is it just, is that a specific industry that's a little bit more behind on like integrating that into as far as just like field Yeah, I think so. Some of it's subjective, but um, we've always been a little slower to adopt um, new technologies or new ways of going to market. Um, some of it has to do with the way Customers relate, right? It's a it's a skilled trade. You can't fix your own air conditioner typically, um, and so um, a lot of our customers have started out as technicians, which is totally needed. And then they 
became entrepreneurs afterwards. And so that true entrepreneurial spirit that you see where they're embracing the newness all the time um, tends to have been adopted a little slower in our industry, but uh, it's catching up. And, you know, I, I think we, I used to compare it to the automotive industry a lot. Um, and I used to feel like they were high tech, but quite honestly, they're not really that high tech either. So um, I think it's just the sign of the times. And then the software has caught up to the business now. Um, and, and so it, the adoption is much higher than it used to be. Now, were hold. you ever in the car industry, Jesse? I was not. Okay. I, I had a, I did a brief stint in the car industry and I, I can tell you it was, uh, we used computers, but that was, that, yeah. was about as, that was about as far as it went. <laughs> the, the cars had all the tech. <laughs> yeah. I think it makes sense working for a tech company or a software company. Um, you know, even ourselves, we're not as integrated as we would like to be. We're still using multiple yeah. systems and multiple platforms. I don't think it's just us. It's probably just a sign of technology is moving so fast it hasn't yes. caught up with. It hasn't caught up with itself yet. So. so fast. Like every year there's something. You know what? Mentioning cars, like cars are almost like computers now. Like it's just crazy. They are. Technology integrated. I, mean, yeah. I know when I first, I'm, I'm going to show my age, but when I was <laughs> 16 and got my license, I got a car and I would get a junker and work on it until I couldn't, until it was something big like the engine or the transmission. Now you can't even change a tire without a computer because the, the sensor yeah. so yeah it's definitely starting to go that route so. and you know the the mower side the green side too robotic mowers are a huge yeah. deal i remember going to equip expo last year and the whole show was robotic mowers and um self-controlled and self-charging and they they follow their map and they mow the lawn for you now it's it's a uh, technology is really really cool what we can do with it it's just now figuring out how to this isn't a technology podcast, by the way, but <laughs> I know. Well, sometimes like I'll I go down like a random I'll hear something and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Let me go down that random squirrel moment. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, no, that's good. I like it. It's right. Eventually we're gonna rebrand to an AI podcast. It comes yeah. up like every it comes up every single episode. Like, like it's it. it's just it's a joke now at this point. But yeah. like it's 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 one of those things like you were saying, like we're like Technology has been advancing so quickly. It's Moore's law, right? Like yeah. every year or whatever, like technology doubles. And I'm probably misquoting that, but yeah. like, that's the idea. And I think it is super cool to see in all of the field services that we, that we work with the growth that they're having. So like robotic mowers and stuff. Um, one time I was uh, back in my training days, I was with a member and they had installed this like massive rooftop unit on top of like a bank. And like, it had like full monitoring. They could like change the temperature yeah. in like all the rooms and like, yeah. just like route air through it, however they wanted to. And it was, yep. blew my mind. Yeah. Blew my mind. See the things you can do. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, let's, let's get back to the service, the service business side. Um, what sort of, uh, back to service businesses, what kind of competitive pressures are we seeing in, uh, in the market? And this can be HVAC. It can be whatever. Yeah, I think we're seeing a, a ton of pressure across the board this year. So, you know, I like to I like to think we've had a, a lot of years of steady growth. The economy's been strong, and even during COVID, with the um, stimulus packages and everything, you know, our industries because they're service related and homeowners need us, right? Um, they need their lawn mode, they need their house clean, they need heating and cooling for sure, especially as hot as as it is right now and as cold as it gets in the winter and and so uh, you know i look at i look at our industry and we've experienced quite a bit of growth and then this year it's been a little different right we're struggling a little bit and and uh it's nothing new but it certainly is probably new to some of our members um and new to some of our team members and um because it's the first time in a while that we've seen sort of this downturn or pre-recession or whatever you want to call it in the yeah. economy and it's created um a different dynamic in competitiveness right if you're a larger company who was struggling to find employees maybe you're now um able to continue to scale and grow and you find more employees versus a smaller company who's finding it a little harder to compete right now with costs going up and and so forth so uh, creates a different different dynamic for sure yeah and if we flip that on its head uh, instead of looking about the the challenges that we're fa that contractors are facing, 
Uh, how do you think that consumers are changing with everything that's going on? Yeah, I think it's it's really not brain surgery to figure out that consumers are a little nervous, right? Because everybody who owns a business or runs a business is also a consumer at some point in their mm -hmm. life. And they're feeling, we're feeling the same things that our consumers are, right? They're seeing interest rates going through the roof. They're feeling the pressure at the grocery store and at the gas pump and everywhere else where inflation has hit us strong and and um they're feeling that fear of are we going into a recession what does that mean for me and so their buying habits are changing right um we're in a very weird time though um unique somewhat to history because there's these positive pressures that are keeping us out of that in that consumer confidence is still pretty high um buying is still pretty high, even with the cost, I think unemployment is pretty low and, and it's, it's at kind of the lowest it's ever been. And, um, pent up demand is still there from, from the, you know, period of time where we were all locked in our house for a couple of years. Um, so I think those co competing economic pressures are really creating some interesting behavior in consumers. And I think they're making decisions, um, they're being more conservative, right? Um, they're, they're, they're not just spending money like crazy. They're thinking about it first and they're slower to respond and maybe they're shopping a little more. Um, and so, yeah, I think consumer buying behavior is exactly what we'd expect during a uncertain economic time. I don't think this is going to be, you know, as bad as we've experienced our friends at Hardy provide us with a lot of data, um, that shows the economy's overall doing okay. Like, Yes, we have all these negative pressures, but we have all these positive pressures that are keeping it going. And I would expect that to continue um, to improve this year and into next year. And we should be able to stay out of a recession. But you're still going to see that difference in consumer buying behavior. Yeah. And I'm with you on that. I've got an optimistic outlook on the economy as, as, as a whole. Yeah. Um, do you think that – so one of the things that you mentioned was that consumers – I'm going to paraphrase uh, – they're sort of buying with more intent. Um, and so with that, do you think that we're seeing a shift in the way that service businesses kind of, uh, put their, their best foot forward or like the strategies that they're implementing? I, I definitely do. You know, in the HVAC world, I, I had dinner with a, a HVAC contractor, a friend of mine last night, and, and he was saying that his customers are shopping. They weren't shopping for the longest <laughs> time. They were just calling him and going, I need a new system, put it in. Like, how soon can you do it? And now they're getting two or three bids again. Um, they're leaning more towards repairing their system versus replacing their system. And we're seeing that quite a bit in the HVAC. We also see that in our work orders volume, by the way, our work orders are that, that flow through field edge change from, um, change from, are changing from, you know, big ticket replacement work orders to much more service work orders, smaller tickets, but more of them, that type of thing. Um, you know, on the, on the lawn care side, we do see a little bit of contraction, right? Like if you're a homeowner and you're feeling the pressure, one of the first things to go maybe is, is your lawn service. And so for our lawn care and green customers, our success, most successful customers are having to pivot their business and they're offering different services. They're offering more hardscaping because they're not, you know, they don't have that bread and butter kind of cutting the lawn and, and trimming the hedges every week. And so they're having to find other ways to, to fill in that business. And, um, you know, I think about, we, we had a really popular webinar in our field services Academy. Uh, I think it was last week, Ryan, where, um, and, and where they talked about Christmas lights and how that was a great shift. It's things yeah. like that, that our contractors are having to think about in order to stay competitive and stay growing. Um, but even with that, you know, we are seeing a little bit of contraction with some of the, some of the contractors and, um, I think that's smart, right? Um, you know, to to pay attention to that and watch the market and watch your costs. So that was going to be one of my questions. Is like, with this happening, that people are trying to, or businesses are having to find ways to be more creative and get more engaged with their clients. Mm -hmm. And I know I've seen it on service autopilot side too, like people offering different pricing structures or like like discounts if you sign up for an annual program or things like yeah. that. Um, so it's been interesting to see the shift and how businesses have to compete more and keep those clients that they have. 
Yeah, I think it's right. And and it's been a little bit of a struggle for him, Becca. It's a really good point. So, yeah. you know, one of the things that um, I've been kicking around for a long time and I, a lot of my roles involves marketing and um, the first tendency is always to kind of cut back on marketing when things are tough, like they are right now or with consumer confidence. And um, I think we're seeing that that's happening with many of our members. The problem we're seeing is that it's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> and many of our members are not doubling down, but they're definitely still putting pressure and using marketing and using a wide range of marketing in order to, to keep driving it. Um, whereas the ones who are cutting back are the ones who are struggling because, you know, no matter what we've talked about consumer confidence and how consumers are being more conservative the fact remains that we are still a much needed product, right? Like our, I need my lawn mode every single week. Um, I need my air conditioning service when it's 99 outside and, and it breaks. I, I don't have that option as a homeowner. I may not be um, seeking it out, but I'm, there's still a huge market for the services that our members provide. And so, um, you know, we're really seeing like the ones who are staying aggressive and keeping up with marketing, but really focusing in on the right ROIs and the right way to do marketing, not just dumping all their money into SEO, but really getting creative with, with unique ways to hit the marketplace. Those are the ones who are continuing to grow and succeed in a challenging market where the ones who have said, oh, the market's slowing down, I need to cut costs. And that conservative approach has really started to cost them in in drinking business so because like, it's like piggybacking off of that like what are some of uh, like examples of creative ways like not just you said this in your seo it's just like is it your trucks is it the t-shirts is it those visual walking advertisements that your team can be? yeah i think it's that i think it's social media has become a really big part of of um localized marketing now i think there's um and it's much less expensive than seo um, also much quicker to react to. So I think social media and then we, we've all, um, I say we all, I say my, my perception of the trend is that we all really got caught up in the digital advertising um, world in the past seven years, maybe. And we've all shifted all our money from offline media, as I would call it, to digital media. And we've forgotten that offline media still works postcards still work, you know, radio still works. Sometimes uh, we have to get smarter about it. YouTube is a great meth method and um, not making that transition and understanding that we still need kind of an overall approach to marketing. You can't just market in one way. You have to market in many ways. You have to cast a wide net, but, but very smartly um, that, that I think is, is the advice that I see and, and um, our agency partners like Optic Marketing have shared with me that they're doing all kinds of creative things to augment the SEO. Don't pull out of SEO, but certainly look at the ROI, look at your lead cost and make sure you're spending money in other areas to, you know, complement what you're doing there. So, yeah, and that's something that working in Academy we've, we've seen. Uh, one of the strategies that's in place there, we call it dominate your market, but it's like owning owning a neighborhood, right? So for like, feel, uh, whether it's, you know, a cleaning business, uh, a plumbing business, uh, lawn care, whatever it is, like just your trucks being there, like has an impact. Just so like make sure your trucks look good. Uh, make sure you're on the side. Make sure there's a number right. for people to call. Uh, and it's, it's not all just Facebook marketing. Because with like Facebook and stuff, like you have to keep dumping money into it for it to keep spitting money back out. That's right. But you, you know, you pay a little bit, wrap your trucks once, and that'll that'll last you for probably a few years. Yeah, definitely. And I think just really measuring um, measuring the ROI of those activities, all of them, right? And it's hard to measure your truck ROI, but it really yeah. is to kind of track where your leads are coming from. Mm -hmm. And if it's calling the number on your truck versus calling the number on Facebook, I think all those are great ways to do it, but understanding where your leads are coming from is super important. Right? Yeah, that's huge. So if you're using Field Edge, make sure you're using your lead sources. Don't skip over it. That's right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the service autopilot equivalent of that, but uh, 
yeah, it's it's yeah. crucial. Yes, <laughs> ways to track in yeah. both in both softwares. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it's just just uh, track it. You got you have to know where that money is coming from, so That's you know right. where to keep putting it. So That's right. and your reports, I'm sure Field Edge the same. Like your reports are so important, and we always emphasize like the data you put in to service autopilot or Field Edge. Like take the time to get accurate numbers because those reports were pooling. Like you put like we have a trainer named Scott. He says this, he has a saying like junk in is junk out. So if you're putting just like yeah. random numbers, That's we're not going to be able to give you the accurate numbers you need to run your business efficiently. So, yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, it doesn't matter if you're using field edge or service autopilot, like if you, whatever, whatever you're using, track okay. that stuff. Right. Yes. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. Def- Agreed. Know your numbers. Honestly, I think that's a great segue into, you know, another thing that I think successful contractors are doing right now to capitalize on that, which is, which is tracking KPIs in a, in mm-hmm. may, maybe a much more meaningful way than they have in the past. You don't need to track KPIs when you have more sales than you can, you know, what to do with. <laughs> um, but when the market tightens up like it is right now, you know, really measuring every aspect of your business and driving results in those important areas um, is a huge deal. And so to me, marketing ROI is a KPI, right? Measuring the mm-hmm. effectiveness of your marketing is a KPI. But measuring the effectiveness of your sales team is also a KPI. You know, how many calls are they going on? What's their closing ratio? What's their upgrade percentage? What's their dollar per sale? Measuring the the KPIs for your techs and their performance. You know, how many calls are they going on um, versus how many, how long are they staying? What's the revenue per call? You know, are they upselling on those calls? Because every call, when there's fewer calls, every call becomes more important. Um, and and so you know i think about measuring kpis you know on the on the green side you know how's your route density are you hitting enough in this in the right area in order to maximize each crew that you're sending out on a day-to-day basis um or do you need to look at your routes and and adjust in order to you know maximize the amount of revenue you get in the amount of time you're sending them out and so KPIs are super important and maybe it's a little self-serving because both of our softwares are great at measuring KPIs or developing and measuring KPIs, but it's absolutely crucial in a time like now where every dollar counts, every cost counts, and every lead really counts to to keep an eye on those KPIs as a business owner or a manager and making sure that you're maximizing every part of your business so that you're still growing and you're staying strong and you're covering your your overhead and make it money at those times. Um, I think it's, it's really a, a key right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And rewind. If you, if you're ever here, if you're, if you're the person that's Googling, what KPI should I track, rewind the podcast and listen to what Jesse just said, because he named off a bunch of really important stuff. Yeah. It's not my, not my job or my place to tell you what the KPI <laughs> should be for sure. I'm a sales guy. Yeah. I mean, but certainly like, measuring those things and looking at them. For sure. Absolutely. And like, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, like knowing how much you're making on calls, knowing what services are profitable, like that's stuff that's going to carry you to success regardless of where you're at. Yeah. So like looking at like things like what are, what are maybe services that are better upsells than, you know, uh, straight sales. That's right. Things things of that nature, like knowing what those services are is something that can really, really help you. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do need an, an additional resource, you know, I, Again, I'm referencing Field Services Academy, but we have a lot of great partners who it is their place and they've earned the right to suggest great KPIs and teach great KPIs. And there's a lot of content available in there that is consumable anytime to, you know, figure out like, what should I be measuring in my business? And whether it's green or housekeeping or plumbing or pools or or HVAC, there's, you know, really standard KPIs that, that they can grab from there to to start implementing and, and driving their business with. Mm-hmm. So on the pilot side, I'm, on field edge, I'm not sure. We have certified advisors or trainers, and I'm sure Academy helps mm-hmm. with that too, as far as like yes. developing KPI. Or and if you don't know what that means, I don't know if we said it, it's key performance indicator for any of those right. who are listening. <laughs> yep. that's, what, that's what a KPI is. <laughs> I like that, Becca. Thank yeah. you. I uh, I use the term way too much, but but it is. Um... <laughs> it's a daily thing for us. So yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. With that, on the flip side, though, is there anything like 
anything else financially business to, businesses should be doing, especially with equipment. That's something I never really thought about um, or assets. Like, do we really need to go out and get that latest and greatest piece of a cool like truck or equipment or more whatever? Or can we like deal or settle, maintain what we have for now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And um, it's probably one that I'm not qualified to answer totally because sometimes it would make more sense to buy equipment that you need in a down cycle because you can get it, you get more life out of it. You might be able to take advantage of a manufacturer or distributor promo because they're trying to move equipment during a slower time. And so there might be a reason to do that uh, now. There also might very well be a reason to you know, tighten the belt and not spend as much money and focus on preventative maintenance and, and getting a little more life out of that equipment. So I, I think the only thing I could suggest there is it's, it's one, another one of those KPIs to measure or another thing to measure in the business to make sure, is this the right time to buy a new piece of equipment? You know, should I be adding a trailer? And if business is good, the answer is probably yes. Um, but if it's, it's slower, maybe you can get more out of the crews that you have um, or the technicians that you have to to really focus on just driving more revenue per the heads that you have or the resources that you have. So great question, Becca. I mean, I, 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 again, I don't know the answer, but it's something to, to do the research on and find the answer for your business. Yeah, food for thought. Yeah, for sure. I can't take total question for sure. credit for that. One of, I know uh, we are great producers. Give us some information, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> They're, li they're listening to us record this. Thanks. Hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> um, you, uh, Jesse, you just mentioned uh, maintenance. Um, so I want to I want to broaden that a little bit for industries maybe that aren't HVAC. Um, so on the HVAC side, things like uh, you know preventative maintenance, those are like recurring services where you'll go out and do stuff, um, and that's really the core of it. It's like it's a it's a recurring service. You think of it mm -hmm. almost like a subscription. Um, how important do you think those are? in slower periods, like, like what we're, we're kind of seeing. I don't know. I just, um, maybe I'll use it. An example is I have about seven streaming services right now for, <laughs> for, uh, TV shows that I don't even watch TV, mm -hmm. but I'm paying for somewhere around seven. I just had this conversation with my daughter and I just keep paying for them. Right. And there's a, an entire industry started through rocket mortgage purchased the company and they're offering a service to find the subscriptions you forgot and cancel them. And so not suggesting we take advantage of our customers here, but subscriptions are a real key for recurring revenue and recurring business. And so, you know, on the HVAC side, we've talked for years about the value of service agreements and, um, you know, helping us balance our cash flow throughout the year, not just seasonally, all our work doesn't have to happen in August when it's 110 outside. We should be able to balance our work across the whole the whole spectrum. And I think, you know, I live in Florida, so lawn care is important to me all year round, right? I need it. It does go dormant in January and February, but I still need my lawn service to come out. And so to me, like, just charge me every month. I don't want to have to think about it. Set up a recurring payment and I will never call you to cancel. I'm going to let you keep coming even in the months where you only have to come once or twice. Um, if you do lawn care and snow removal, right? I don't, I'm just going to pay you the same amount and you handle all of it, you know, all the time. <laughs> Handling that through recurring payments is out of sight, out of mind. Um, and it, and it, it's just much harder to think about changing companies or canceling because it's easy for me, right? I made a decision. As long as my provider is providing good customer service and they come out when I need them, I'm probably never going to cancel that subscription. I'm just going to keep paying. And I think in, in good times, you probably have all the business you can handle. And so you're worried about too many subscriptions or you might be worried about too many subscriptions. But during times like this, the more of those you can have um, to balance out your your workforce and your productivity and your your um your capacity is just is just key and so you know payment providers like us um like our sister company clarent have made it so easy to set up recurring payments and so if my 
you know, lawn service billed me on a recurring payment, $150 a month, I would never question it. I would just never think twice about it. Um, so I think it's really important. It's always been important, not just now, um, but I think it's even more important now um, to do that. We've become a subscription society. And so um, there's a trend in the HVAC industry called leasing, uh, where you actually never buy your system. You just pay a monthly payment for the system. And that includes all your maintenance filters. Um, and you pay for that until the system dies. And then you get a new system and keep paying for it. It's really like a monthly service to use your HVAC system. Now, it hasn't totally taken hold where America is not a society where we want to just keep paying for things. We like to think we're going to own it at some point. Mm -hmm. but it has taken off you know, in a, in a much bigger way than we think. And again, it's that recurring payments. It's, it's the peace of mind knowing that I'm paying this every month and it's, it's going to happen. So being able to do that is, is huge. So yeah. the other thing that's really important right now is being able to offer financing options. Um, you know, as our, as our, um, as consumers tighten their belt, maybe they've run out of savings a little bit because things have gotten a little more costly they still need the services. And so having the ability to finance a new HVAC system or finance the work that they want in their yard for tree, our tree company partners, tree removal is expensive for a homeowner. And if you need to do it to prevent some damage, um, being able to finance that is really important or being able to finance that patio project that you've been wanting to do um, is really important. So offering payments and offering finance options are more important now than, than they ever were. For sure. Yeah. I think it's definitely taking hold. Cause I know like for my phone, for instance, if you have a product, it's good quality. I will. Hey, yeah. Give me that new iPhone. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll pay the month to month cause I'll pay it off eventually, but then I'll, yeah. just, you know, upgrade or get the next one something. So That's it's like, right. I, th I see it in the each back and lawn care service industry too, that, Something that yeah. will take yeah. a Man, phone companies have figured it figured it out. They, they, they have figured it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They and, certainly and have. I think part <laughs> of that is like being able to finance something or like being able to join into a subscription service like really lowers that barrier of entry. Where, pe does. where people are worried about cost and whatnot. So it's like, well, hey, if I could pay 25, 30 bucks, whatever it is this month and the next month and the month after that, instead of paying, you know, 150 bucks for you to come out twice a year to do like a, like an HVAC maintenance. I'm just throwing yeah. numbers out for the sake of the, the argument, but like that, that's something that's really enticing. I was reading a report. Um, I think it was from Harvard business review. Uh, don't quote me on it. If I can find it, I'll link it in the show notes, but uh, it was talking about like the buying patterns uh, generationally. So looking at the way that millennials, baby boomers, and now Gen Z is Gen Z sort of enters the workforce and has money to spend. Like, like when they're looking at stuff, how are they buying it? And, with millennials and Gen Z, that seems to be a trend is like subscriptions and that lower barrier of entry, even if it's a slightly higher cost in the long run, it's something that seems to be uh, taking hold. And as yeah. part of that group, uh, <laughs> I'm guilty. I'm guilty yep. of it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we all are, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's interesting with subscriptions and payments, though, because, I mean, by the way, those of you listening, let's just plug clearant, essay payments, skill Dutch payments, sign up, credit card processing. Because I, <laughs> I speak to a few people on my training calls who are still doing like cash and check. And it's like, I'm struggling here. I'm not pounding to get my money to get paid. I'm like, oh man, I need mm -hmm. to. So like even strategies on converting their clients who are so used to paying by cash or check to credit card. I'm sure everyone has their reason, but. If you can do it, I just seen how it makes such a huge difference in your revenue. How yeah. Really come. Yeah. And Becca, I think you brought up a really good point about collections in general, like having to collect on that service that you provide every single month is a productivity waste. I mean, it's, right. it's a time suck. It's a huge Sometimes cost. You don't collect on it. And so if you have those payments set up automatically, you know, people worry about the cost of financing or the cost of a credit card swipe. Yes, calculate it into your overhead, but at the same time, the cost of not collecting is so much more. Um, and so using those payments um, are great. And, and you put the plug in for Claire, I will too. It's a great solution. 
you know, I love our, our, um, you know, our pricing is very aggressive on that side. So um, there's really no excuse not to do it. So I agree. Yeah. The labor cost to having someone sit down and try to call and collect people when you could either take payment on site or just have them pay online. Yeah. Uh, going back to the generational thing, guys, like I, I don't want to pick up the phone and, and give you my credit card number. But if you send me an email and it's like, give us the money that you get, you owe us, like, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Yes. So it's not, it's not a generational thing. I've stopped talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I can't buy it online. Got I just it. Got it. don't buy it anymore. I think <laughs> way with cybersecurity, like, I'm not giving you my phone, my credit card or the phone or mm -hmm. mailing this in. And no, it's like, yeah. I do too, yeah. but convenience wins every time. I yes, know. it does. <laughs> so I think the I think the Explore IT team has got me trained pretty good with cybersecurity. Yes, uh, right. Just don't every, click every now anything, Ryan. Don't click yeah. anything in the email. Yeah. <laughs> um, every now and then they'll send out little emails that are like tests, and if you if you get it wrong, it's like, come on, man. Yeah, and like, and then right. they'll send you a training video, and they're like, this is yeah. Anyway, cybersecurity very important. Um, and when it comes to processing credit cards, obviously more so. Uh, so for sure. uh, clearing is compliant and secure and all that stuff, just to be clear. I, wanna, I don't want to very, very blur any lines with that. They're very secure. They take that so seriously. So seriously, yes. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. And we have to. Yeah, <laughs> it's a requirement. Yeah. All right. So uh, thinking about the future, uh, looking at like this, even the second half of this year, uh, what sort of industry shifts and trends do you potentially see happening? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not, if I had a crystal ball, first of all, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and I'm certainly not, you know, an economist who has like this, this, you know, vastly detailed view. I would expect that we would, we would experience some more of the same mm -hmm. um, throughout the rest of this year, just sort of additional consumer you know, fears, um, additional consumer kind of conservative actions, um, and certainly, uh, you know, some slight improvement from an economy standpoint, or at least not any worse. And so, um, you know, I think we, if we've, if we've done a really good job kind of managing the change in the beginning of this year, that should help us, you know, continue to go in through the back half of the year. If we don't feel like we've done a great job managing the change in the beginning of the year, then it's definitely time to go back to the to the basics and fundamentals and start looking at what you can do to continue to succeed and thrive in this in this um, sort of uncertain times, I guess is how I would put it. So certainly not in disastrous times. We've we've I think we've all lived through worse times, you know, um, I certainly haven't yeah. managed, but um, we've all lived through tougher times, um, but it doesn't mean this one's not tough and it doesn't mean we shouldn't react accordingly. So I would say just buckle down and take a look at the things you need to do in your business to ride this out um, for the next six to 24 months. So Beautiful. And if you do find that crystal ball, can you give it to the weatherman? Yeah. <laughs> oh my yeah, gosh. Exactly. <laughs> cool. Definitely. Yeah. Ugh. We'll keep it to myself from a finance standpoint. Yeah. And no. To the weatherman, so we have more reliable weather. Well, you know what you do? You lease it to the weatherman. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. There it is. There it is. That's <laughs> smart. Lease it out. See. Yeah. Full circle. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> That is hilarious. I mean, I guess even speaking on weather, even that's an impact. Like you see the we have some droughts in some cities. It's gotten better. I know out west and things like that, but just there's so much that impacts our these, these our service business mm -hmm. um, folks out here. So definitely, yeah. Like the you good said, news, Becca, is people. that everything we've talked about, all the blocking and tackling and the fundamentals that we've talked about yeah. on this call. And that our partners, you know, our partner preach through Field Service Academy, all of that is applicable no matter what the challenge oh. is that you face, you know, so. I love that. Here you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to try to find a way to plug an AI in here somewhere, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that's going to work, but I guess if there's any other, like, um, what was the question? Like, 
future, the future of the industry, just maybe robots will be doing everything one day. AI I, robots. I, you know, I definitely think that there is some, some of that. Um, <laughs> and I'm, uh, you know, I'm a little conservative about AI. It's, it's uh, kind of creepy. I guess I watched too much Terminator <laughs> in my <laughs> younger days, but AI is definitely a little bit creepy. Um, and I still think, um, despite what I said about me only wanting to buy things online and despite, you know, kind of all of these trends and changes, I still want to know the service provider that I'm working with, who I'm letting into my yard, into my home, you know, near my families. And so I don't know how fast those things will change for us. I think, um, you know, service providers, we have a very intimate relationship with them. Um, and so, you know, having those, yeah members on our platforms that are trustworthy and and that matters um still even and above ai so i'm probably not doing you any favors because you want to talk AI. <laughs> oh no Thinking you're right you're... Against it to some it's a, hey, it's an open platform for we're not sponsored <laughs> by ai so it's it's okay <laughs> yeah that's a good point though because i guess that's another thing in businesses um as we're in this competitive market now should keep in mind it's just how you treat your people, your your clients, just you know that kindness. That uh, we have a pest control guy that comes by, and he'll talk to my mom about music and the oldies and all of that, and that makes a difference between going with someone else. Just, it definitely does. You know, yeah. someone you can connect with. So, absolutely yeah. agree with that. I mean, yeah. he's in your home with the, your pets and your children and your your mom. You know, that's somebody who you want to be able to trust and and have a relationship with. Absolutely. Yeah. And regardless of technology and everything, and all the enhancements and AI and everything of that, like at the end of the day, we're service businesses, right? So like without that service, it doesn't matter. So yeah, providing that service and doing it well is, is key. I think we could have narrowed this whole podcast to that one sentence, Ryan, I think <laughs> just <laughs> continue to provide that high level of customer service and, and uh, keep sending your messages out and keep delivering, you know, good, good value service. And I think, you know, we're going to weather any storm. So for any service businesses getting started out there, is there anything like any other advice you would give them encouragement, not just, you know, on the business side, but maybe on the personal side, things like that, that they can be doing or taking into account. Um, and how can they be successful right now in this, in this economy? Yeah, you know, a I, lot of what we spoke about helps, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of what we spoke about helps, but, you know, fundamentally, like if you're just starting out or if you've been in 30 years in business, 30 years, it, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that I, I don't know everything. I don't even know anything. So asking for help from my partners, asking for help from my peers, asking for help from a network of, you know, professionals who have been through what I'm going through, I think is always a good choice, you know? Ultimately, the blocking and tackling and the fundamentals and taking care of our customers are the things that are going to set us apart. But there's a ton of challenges. Our business has gotten a lot more complex. Um, and just making sure that you lean on a peer group to help you with those challenges um, and not being afraid to ask. Uh, because, you know, if you're just starting out, you won't have all the answers. And if you've been in 30 e business 30 years, like me, you get cocky and you think you know everything and you don't, <laughs> definitely don't know everything. And so you still need to reach out for help. And so, you know, finding that group of, again, partners, professionals, peers, um, industry associates, or just good, solid business fundamental folks to answer those questions and help you through the tough times, yeah. I think is, is vitally important. Don't be afraid to, to ask. And on that note, Jesse, uh, talking more about my, my regular day job, because this is only part of it, right? Like we're, right. we're working on building that community. That's right. Through Field Services Academy, which we've mentioned a few times through through this podcast, but uh, Field Services Academy, that's that's basically exactly what we're gonna do with it. Yeah, I think it's such a great place to, uh, because we're not experts. I think we've, Ryan, you and I have talked about it when we were putting together Field Services Academy. It's not, we're not the experts, but we know them all. We know who the experts <laughs> in the industry are. We know who the experts are in in the green space and the cleaning space. And we also know that our members are awesome. I mean, they've run awesome businesses and grown. And, you know, we have a network of biggest badasses on the service autopilot side who 
I've gotten to know over the last year and just love. And they're so um, intelligent about business and, and excited to help others. You know, I th I'm excited about that, just creating that network where they all can have that common place. If you need help on hiring, we have professionals in there that can help you in hiring. And if you need help on, you know, financials, we have experts in there that can help with financials or KPIs. <laughs> um, yep. it's, it's a great place to do that. And then I definitely don't want to um, undercut the importance of just the networking that's that's in there between um, the members in the peer group. So I, I think it's a great plug and a great, a great, um, thought because we're, we're trying to create this environment where that all can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm really curious cause I'm not too involved mm -hmm. in, in that side with the Academy. Is it, um, is it still being like, I know you know you're still building it out. Is it like, it's going to be like an open forum kind of thing where people can come and watch online in mm -hmm. person, a mix of everything or. Yeah, I think um, at its foundation, we have a lot of partners who are um, training and consulting and coaching organizations who yes. are providing content. Also, service providers, you know, who have been doing this a long time, they're providing content around marketing or hiring. And and um, the members of Service Autopilot, I mean, um, Field Services Academy can join and they can consume all that content. They can ask questions of each other and other members. Um, it is an open forum. It's it's um, it's actually on like a social media type platform where they can consume the content and interact with each other and um, find what they need and search. And um, yeah, so it's it's really a unique kind of situation. And part of you know my position is being in a unique position. I told you earlier, like I'm not the smart guy. I'm the one who listens to our partners and our members. And uh, so it was really fun to put those partners and, and members together in, in a way that um, is beneficial to both. And we just kind of, I, I think I told somebody the other day, they, Field Service Academy is like the dinner table <laughs> and our partners yeah. are the dinner. Um, I like that. I like that. We, we provide the place. It feels setting. a little Jurassic Park, but I, I know where you're going with it. And <laughs> we provide the silverware and the wine glasses and the fancy napkins. Yep. And our partners provide the five star dining that goes on the plate and I think mm -hmm. and the members. And so I think it's, it's a really cool place to be. Yeah. And uh, if you are curious about field services Academy, because it does come up on this podcast, uh, cause it's awesome. I'm not biased. You know, it's like I said, it's, it's most, it's most of where my efforts focused or anything, but like, uh, no, like gen genuinely, like it's something that like, I'm very proud of uh, that uh, myself, Jesse and the rest of the team have, uh, have been putting together. Uh, so if you are curious on learning more about Field Services Academy, reach out to your CSM. They should be able to get you pointed in the right direction. Uh, and the benefit is you get to see more of my face and you'll learn a thing or two along the way. <laughs> That's it. And you don't have to see much of my face still. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jesse does a lot of the background stuff. <laughs> there any final thoughts um, to leave anyone with before I close this out? Usually I close it out. With the AI question, but uh, uh, Jesse, I just I do, I do want to thank you. I I know your schedule gets pretty crazy, so uh, the chance to be able to sit down and talk with you has been pretty great. Outside okay. of like the meetings that we have scheduled meetings normally, have but together. yeah. <laughs> I just put a face to the name myself, so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, this is great. Well, cool and it's been a lot of fun for me too. And hopefully, um, you know, the folks listening are going to get some value out of this and and some ideas that they can implement to to continue to grow and and thrive during during our crazy crazy year that we're having <laughs> sounds Great. good jesse thank you again so much for being a guest with us on the profit roadmap if anyone listening uh people want to learn more i should i feel like i know the answer to this already but if people want to know more about you and how to get started with field edge and service model pilot where should they look um yeah i think calling your cs is a great start if you want to reach out to me directly my email address um is jesse.barrick at exploretechnologies.com feel free to reach out i love to have conversations and learn what we could do better um, to provide more value to our members, you know, which partners we don't have in the platform that we need and, and what we can do from a software standpoint to make it better and, or what other services we can provide. So, but really your CS is always going to be your first 
first line of defense when yes, you need let's something. Use that, yes. <laughs> yes, contact your CSOs. And thank you so much for listening to the Profit Roadmap. And remember, you can listen to this show on all major streaming platforms, including Apple, YouTube, Spotify, and more. Be sure to visit our show notes at serviceautopilot.com forward slash podcast to get the links to all the topics we discussed in today's show. If you have any questions, if you have recommendations or want to be on the show yourself, email us at ProfitRoadmap at ExploreTechnologies.com. Explore is spelled X-P-L-O-R. If you enjoyed today's show, please tell a friend. Adios. <laughs> all right. Later, guys. Jesse, thank you so much.